Anyway, it's been a fantastic feast. Uh, this is just great, wonderful. Love Pasadena or uh, PCB. Uh, I want to thank Dan and Kim for putting all this on. And I know they get a lot of work, but it's a, it's you guys done. It's just a great job. It's been wonderful, well organized, and just a wonderful time so far. And that's probably one of mine, grandchildren. Anyway. A son says, I watched the guy do 50 push-ups. I'm sorry, my son. My son says, I watched the guy do 50 push-ups in a row. Can you do that, Dad? I said, that's nothing. I watched the guy do 100 push-ups in a row just the other day. <laughs> For those that know me, I usually like to start off on a joke. So if you don't get anything else out of the message, at least you got that. Anyway, today is family day. And I want to talk about, obviously, families. Um, if you would, turn with me to John 1, John 1, verse 10. John 1, verse 10. John 1, verse 10, we'll start in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, we're celebrating the coming kingdom of God. This time we're celebrating or these days we're celebrating the millennium. We're celebrating here as individuals, we're celebrating as families, but we're all a part of a bigger family. We're part of God's family. So I thought long and hard about what the title should be, and it's, we're a family. I'm not a really big thinker at all. But we're a family. We are a family of God. God started his own family. Turn back with me, turn to Hebrews. I guess we were in John, so turn forward to Hebrews. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, we're going to start in verse 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time passed to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. God the Father and Jesus Christ have had a father and son, and they still have a father and son relationship. Then we can go a little farther, actually back to the beginning, of humans, then they created the first humans as family, a husband and a wife. Turn with me to Genesis 1, 27. Again, very familiar scriptures. Genesis 1, verse 27. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God created humans in their image, and he told them to be fruitful. He told them to multiply, to have children, and to have families. Go to the next chapter, Genesis 2, 24. Sees where God gave them instruction. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 
God says, you shall become a family. You are to create a family. That was the plan from the beginning, family, husband and wife, and then, God willing, children. God worked with families. Noah built the ark. He took his wife, their three sons, and their wives. God worked with Abraham. If you read, go over to Genesis 18. Genesis 18, verse 16. <laughs> Genesis 18, verse 16. Then the men got up from their meal and looked out toward Sodom. We know this is the time when the angels came to uh, Abraham and Sarah. They were overlooking um, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham was actually negotiating with God at this time. And they were finished. The men got up from their meal and looked out toward Sodom. As they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham, the Lord asked, for Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. God knew that Abraham would direct his children to follow God. That's why he called him. He said, I knew Abraham was going to do this. He was that kind of man. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the other 11 children of Jacob, Israel, followed in Abraham's footsteps. Not perfectly. <laughs> Not perfectly at all, as we know. We can read that. But God worked with this physical family. They were part of his family. Later, through Jesus Christ, he built his spiritual family. He built his church, and he created a family of believers. This time, people from all walks of life, from all different physical families, that believed and worshipped together. Turn with me to Acts 2, verse 40. Acts 2, verse 40. We'll start in verse 40. This is Peter talking, as you know, after the day of um, Pentecost. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had in all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate food. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God's family that day grew by 3,000 members. His family of believers. And we are here. We're a part of that family. We're a part of that very first family. We're part of God's family. God has called us to be a part, a member of his family, of his own family, God chose us, he chose you, and he chose me to be a part of his very family. There's an interesting story I like in Matthew 12. If you go to Matthew 12, Matthew 12, verse 46. Matthew 12, we'll start in verse 46. Verse 46, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside, seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, 
your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus said that those who do the will of his father in heaven are his family. As I look out here today, I see those who are doing the will of God, who are here at the Feast of Tabernacles, learning and growing a part of that family of God. What a tremendous blessing that is. Now, we know that Jesus didn't forsake his personal family, his physical family at all. If you go to John 19, Jesus thought of his physical mother up until the very end. John 19, verse 25. John 19, verse 25. John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. At that time, and from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Jesus told John, a disciple, to look after his mother. He wanted her cared for, loved. Now, Jesus had brothers and sisters. We know that. But at the time, they were not full believers at that time. So he said, John, Take care. My mother is your mother. Some of us here are without our physical families. You know, my wife and I, we both grew up in church. All of us walk in the same path, going to the Feast of Tabernacles. I went to the Feast. This is 60-something for me. I know I don't look it. Thank you. But at 61 or something like that, Feast, um, but, you know, sadly, most of our families, both of our families, they started to walk. Well, they, they didn't start. They walked a different path. They went away from this truth. They went away from this way of life. They decided not to be a part of this family at this time. But we are blessed. As my son Ryan said, I'm here with my wife, Sharla, here with my three sons, our two sit oh, sister-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, and our three beautiful grandchildren. It's a blessing. It really is a blessing. And I know that there are other families here, many multi-generational, which is a wonderful blessing. And we're here celebrating together as physical families, but we're also celebrating here as a spiritual family. Each person here is part of that family, a part of our family. That is the beauty of being called into this <clears throat> way of life. You are called into a family. You are part of a wonderful blessing a wonderful family. You know, each new person is welcome to the family. We've been blessed in the Atlanta and Buford areas where we attend to have several new people and families over the last several years. And this last year in our physical family, we're blessed with two new members to our physical family. Two precious little girls were born, one in February and the second in July. They've been such a great joy to all of us. You know, each little girl is welcomed into the family and loved by everyone in the family. And in both cases, these little girls, they're loved by three families. They're loved by our family, our physical family. They're loved by my daughter-in-law's families. And they're loved by the church family. I love seeing those sweet little girls picked up and loved by their aunts and uncles and their cousins. And I love seeing them picked up and loved at church with their spiritual family. You know, we became grandparents almost three years ago when our grandson, I better mention Charlie or he gets upset. But when Charlie was born and now with granddaughters, we see life a bit differently. You know, I was called grandpa before I came up here. 
And you know, two of the sweetest names I've ever had in life are daddy and grandpa. It's a blessing to have that. You know, having grandchildren has just been just awesome. I told my wife if I knew how good it was, I would have skipped just having children and gone right to the grandchildren. You can always send them back at night. We do love our sons. But you know, I can understand, and I'm not trying to be vain or anything here. I can understand a little bit more about God. I thought I knew as a, as a father, but as a grandfather, I just see things a little differently. And it's a blessing. Each time a member is added to the family, there is more love to go around. You know, we do not, we not take love from one to give it to another. We add more love. You know, when you get married, you are so much in love. You think that all the love you have is for that one person. In about two weeks, reality hits in. No, I'm... But you have so much love for that one person. You are so in love. And then you have a child. If you're blessed to have a child, that first child comes into your life and you think, wow, I didn't know I could love something else so much as I love that child. And then you have your second child. And you have that same intense love for that second child. You love that second child with the same love. You don't take any love away from the first child. You don't say, well, I got two, now I'm going to come and love you about 70% of the time until I get to know this one. You're at 30. You don't do that. You love each child. Then you have your third child, and you love them just the same. You have enough love to go around. And then those who have four or five and six or whatever children, as it was back in the 60s and 70s in the church, it's amazing how much love. Your love continues to go and grow and grow. Each time they become a part of your family. And then your children, they grow up and they get married and you love your daughter-in-laws or sons-in-laws most of the time. Depends if you got if you help choose them. No, we love ours tremendously. And then they bring these special little babies into your life, these grandchildren. And again, your love just continues to grow and grow. And it's amazing how much it grows. You love those grandchildren as much as you love your children. But you know, it's the same way in God's church. You know, it's amazing how special it is when a new person comes in that door. We're blessed to have that as part of a new church. Each time a new member is brought or delivered into other family, we love that new person the same way we love others. They become part of that family. They learn our way of life. They learn who we are. They learn what we believe. It's an absolute gift from God. And I believe that God does the same with his family. Each new member he deeply loves. Each member comes into the church. Now, God loves all. I'm not saying, please don't misquote me, that God only loves the church. I'm not saying that. But God loves his family, his first fruits, tremendously. And each person that comes in as part of that first fruit family, God loves and he cares for. How much? Well, we know John 3.16, if you ever watch football on TV or go to a game. John 3.16, that God loved us so much that he gave his only son for us. That's a tremendous amount of love. You know, when new members come into the church, like into our congregation in Atlanta and Buford, they're like, many of them are like newborn babies. They have a little bit of understanding they either got the beyond today or they watched something on TV or they just or they got on the internet or whatever or they knew a neighbor. But they came in and they're new and they're like a newborn baby. And our job is like when we have new children is to nurture them. It's like Ryan was talking about being dependent. Yes, they're dependent on God, but they're also dependent on church members to help them grow, to help them become part of that new family. Because the church is our ultimate family. 
God wants us to be a part of his family, a part of his future. And again, we are here as family learning and growing together. You know, family is important. You can look up characteristics of a strong family, which I did, and find numerous lists, numerous examples of what makes a strong family. And a base, from what I found, there's four basic points about families that they, they mention. Families are there for one another. Families teach you values. Families offer unconditional love. Families help children feel a part of something bigger or special. And these are values that we have here and we will experience through the millennium. You know, when this Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled one day and it will be fulfilled, we will be in the millennium helping Jesus Christ rebuild a ravaged war, world, I'm sorry, not a war. There will be war. You can read in Daniel, you can read in Revelation, you can read about some of the times that will be, hap that will be happening. But we will be there helping rebuild, helping restore families. You know, as mentioned in the four points that strong families have, in our church family, we are there for one another. We'll be teaching future families how to be there, how to be there for one another, how to help, how to encourage, how to strengthen. Within our church family, we are taught values. We're taught values through God's word, through the Bible. We're taught in the millennium, we'll be helping teach God's values to those we are helping. The values that you're learning here, the values that you learn at church every week, the values you learn from God's spirit dwelling in you, you're going to be taking those values and helping families, helping individuals learn and grow and have the same blessing, the same opportunities that we have today. You know, turn with me to Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 20. Isaiah 30, I'm sorry, Isaiah 30, verse 21. Isaiah 30, verse 21, and this will be us. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whatever you turn to the left, we will be teaching, we will be instructing, we will be helping. We will be building families, helping people build families. And within our church, we are taught to love one another unconditionally, and we do. We'll be helping to teach others in the millennium to love one another, to love their families, to love their neighbors. Within our church family, we teach our children and our grandchildren that they are part of something much bigger, something special, something awesome, something wonderful. And in the millennium, we'll be teaching people the same thing. How great and how wonderful would it be for your neighbors to know what we know? Everybody goes back, you have a meeting in the neighborhood and you discuss, you discuss what you learned at the feast that year. What a blessing, what an honor, I mean, great thing that's gonna be. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, we'll start in verse 7. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, this was given to the, Israel, to the Israelites before they entered the promised land. It is what we will be telling those we work with in the millennium as well. In verse 7, for what great nation is there that God that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us. For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. God wants us to pass on the knowledge of what we know to our children. 
and to our grandchildren, to our nephews, to our nieces, to our adopted children and grandchildren, to our families, to this family. They're part of something special, something wonderful, something fantastic. We are a group of believers. We're called the children of God, and that's a blessing. Ryan read 1 John 3, 1, and I'll read it again. So don't you have to turn there. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We think about that. We'll see him as he is. We are children of God now. What we will be when Christ returns has not been made known to us. I thought Ryan did a good example about talking about a child like Charlie thinking about wanting to be like Daddy, or Sadie wanting to be like Mommy, or Elliot wanting to be like Mommy. Got to get them all. When Christ returns, we'll be working with him, teaching a new way of life to those who have not heard of God, who have not had any hope, and have just gone through a tribulation. We will be showing them and giving them hope. We will have a part with Jesus Christ in helping so many others become a part of our, of our special family. We will be teaching them about this Feast of Tabernacles. Turn with me to Isaiah 2, verse 2. Mr. Shabe quoted this on opening night. Isaiah 2, verse 2. Isaiah 2, verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the law, the Lord, from Jerusalem. We will be teaching about the Feast of Tabernacles, teaching them to go up to Jerusalem to the house of God and to learn to walk in his paths. Throughout the year, we will be telling them how families should live. We'll be helping them learn God's way of life, the new, a brand new way of life for them. And they will learn. They will learn God's ways and they will receive his wonderful blessings. Zechariah 4, I'm sorry, Zechariah 8, verse 4. Mr. Shabe also read this one on opening night. Zechariah 8, verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. That was quoted earlier as well during this feast by Mr. Shabe and somebody else as well. I have seen that at this feast this year. I know we're not in Jerusalem yet, But I've seen families down by the pool, on the beach, playing together. Old men, me, and younger women, my wife, watching these children play, enjoying them play, laughing together, enjoying the sun, enjoying the fellowships. And that is a big part of the Feast of Tabernacles, learning to play, learning to interact with one another. And hopefully we're all setting examples as we're down by the pool, as we're on the beach, of playing, of helping, of encouraging. Because we're going to be teaching families and individuals in the millennium, some of them how to play. It's going to be a lot of work. We're also going to have to teach them how to play, how to be nice to one another. 
think the first maybe 100 years would be like a kindergarten class. It teaches them to get along and not to hit one another. We'll be helping groups of people to become part of a family, part of a new way of life. We'll be working with Jesus Christ as he restores family values. We will help, we will help him teach those family values. At the Feast of Tabernacles, we have the opportunity to interact with one another for eight days. Seven for the feast and the last great day, eighth day. We're given an opportunity to live eight days in pretty close proximity. To share fellowship, to share meals. To worship together and to play together. We have the opportunity to learn to become a better family. You know, we know in a lot of families, there's sometimes that awkward uncle or aunt or cousin that is just a little bit weirder than the rest of us. Or at least we think they are. But for the sake of family peace, we strive to get along. We don't always do this perfectly and sometimes not very well at all. In our church family, let's be honest, we may have one or two that may be just a little harder to get along with. You know who you are. <laughs> I could be one of them at times. But we have the opportunity at the Feast of Tabernacles to work that, to work on that, to work things out. You know, this is the happiest time of the year. This is the best time of the year as we're experiencing God's kingdom, thinking about God's kingdom, thinking about the millennium and being a part of that. So we take this time, these eight days, to get along, to encourage, to help, to love one another. We're going to be working together initially for a thousand years, working as a family, helping those who really need it. There will be very difficult personalities to deal with, and we'll have to have a lot of patience. We have a wonderful opportunity this week to work on that. Look around you. Look outside your immediate family. Look outside your row. These are people you're going to spend a thousand plus years with. Working side by side. Encouraging, helping one another. And then we'll be helping others become like our family is today. And hopefully we're good, strong examples. We'll be helping people to become like Jesus Christ to become that perfect example. Again, we're a family. We're God's chosen family. He called you. He stirred you to repent. He forgave you. He is offering you a place in his eternal family. Today is family day, and we're celebrating the family. The Feast of Tabernacles is a wonderful time for family. I'm going to reminisce a little bit. I remember the excitement as a young boy, going to the feast, the anticipation of eight days of fun. As a little boy, like Ryan said, sometimes the messages, I mean, it was hard to sit there, especially when you're little. But we always wanted to go because it was a time for fun. You know, the anticipation of just driving to the feast, spending time with family and friends, Driving to the feast site, we'd see other cars. Remember the little green stickers on the cars? How exciting that was on the road. Oh, there's a church family over there. There's a church family over there. There's an orange sticker. It's a minister. But those were great times. Be on the side of the road, and we'd see, like, uh, you know, parking, go into a, a parking where they had roadside rest. We'd see a green sticker, and automatically you felt more at home more comfortable there. It was a great thing. And I remember that as a little boy, seeing that. Driving up to the feast site, many of the restaurants and businesses had welcome to the Church of God. In the early days, we spent a lot of time in Wisconsin Dells. There were restaurant signs stating that they were serving beef, beef bacon, and beef sausage that week on the signs. It was wonderful. Those were great times. And those are days on the first night, and on the holy day, there'd be 10,000 plus people. You know, we would get those feast messages like Mr. Preston read, 
you know, from uh, Lake of the Ozarks, we're here celebrating with 8,000 people. From the Poconos, we're here celebrating with 10,000 people. From Wisconsin Dells, we're celebrating with 12,000 people. Those were great days. Now, those were special times for my family, special memories for me as a young boy. You know, as you heard in the sermon on our Tuesday about daring to dream, as a young boy, I dreamed of the millennium and the kingdom, a time as a young boy when all animals would be tame, being able to wrestle with a grizzly bear, running with a cheetah. I can maybe wrestle with a duck and run with a sloth with a limp. That's about my speed now, but I still look for those days. As a child, I thought about those days as a little boy, being able to go and open up all the zoos and just play with and pat all the animals. It was a great, great memories. I used to dream of living with family and friends forever. These were things that excited my mind and made me long for the Feast of Tabernacles every year. And I know my wife has the same memories. You know, we tried to recreate these memories with our boys as they grew up. The number of people attending the feast sites became smaller, a lot smaller, but the excitement was still there. The energy was still there. I remember so many different sites that you walk in, there may be 30, 40 people there, but there's an energy. There's, a, there's God's spirit is there. We've been blessed to be able to take our children to different places around the world. We sang hymns in, we didn't do a different language, but we heard the hymns being sung in different languages. Talked to different people, experienced with them eight days and had dinner with them, talking to them about their lives. It was a wonderful memory. A wonderful time at knowing that God's plan is bigger than whatever church we were in, whether we were in Columbus, Ohio, whether we're in Atlanta, Georgia, God's plan is bigger than that. It's a worldwide plan. We got to experience that and to worship together and enjoy the Feast of Tabernacles. And now we are blessed to see our boys as adults with their wives and now grandchildren. It's a blessing to see this excitement for God's Feast of Tabernacles passed on to another generation. You know, I mentioned our, two, our two-year-old son, Charlie, my wife and I accidentally mentioned the feast, I don't know, sometime early summer to him. You know, we're going to the feast. We're going to the feast. And that's all he talked about. He had no idea we had to wait months. But his anticipation of the feast, now again, his, his anticipation of the feast is not hearing Grandpa speak. His anticipation of the feast is maybe get, feast is going to the beach, getting a new toy, but that's okay. It's to have fun and to learn God's way of life, to see that mom and dad do this that they enjoy this. It's like Ryan said, they want to be like mom and dad. They want to experience things like mom and dad. The Feast of Tabernacles is a wonderful family time, a family tradition that has been passed on. Tradition, but commandment that has been passed on for generations. You know, there are many generations of families sitting in this room as we talked about. I know there are generations there's generations of beans. There's gravies. There's a lot of gravies over there. There's dances in the back. There's the Knuckle family. I know a couple of their generations. There's the Sapesiac family. Several generations of those. And I know there's others. There's several generations of families here. They're passing that on one generation to another, which is a fantastic thing, which is wonderful, which is a blessing. You know, there's new families. We heard yesterday of the young lady, Deborah. She just got engaged to Larry. They're from, I don't know their last names, but Deborah's a little spark plug. You'll see her, she sits in the back over there. And then we've had a couple of baptisms this feast. So the family is growing. The family is expanding. And I hope each time it does, we welcome and we love those new people as they're part of our family now. You know, I mentioned before, years ago, growing up in the church, and I'm sure some of you will remember this, we had services twice a day. In the morning, in the afternoon, or in the morning, in the evening, for eight days. And as a child, it was tough. But you know, I never wanted to not go to the feast because of that. 
I never wanted to miss a day. I never wanted to stay home. Now I will admit when they went to one service, it was nice. You know, those go-karts in Wisconsin Dells aren't going to, you know, drive by themselves. We needed to be on them. And downtown in Wisconsin, you know, somebody had to eat that fudge. And I had way too much. But I think the church, we knew, we understood as time, the family, this is important. This is hugely important to come in and listen and hear messages. But it's also important to take time and spend time with your family. Go to restaurants. Go miniature golfing. Go do things with your family and other families members. The feast is a time for fellowshipping with others, learning to help one another, learning to encourage one another, learning to be a part of something bigger. Because again, we're going to pass that on. We're going to teach this down the road to others who need to learn this. Now, for some individuals, they may be the only one in the, of their physical family that God has called at this time. For some, they may be the only one left that still follows this way of life. The church family is very important to them. We all need a sense of belonging. And a good family does that for them. At the Feast of Tabernacles, we're all family. If you came alone, you're part of the family. If it's your first feast, you're part of the family. And hopefully we all can help and encourage and welcome all those who are just first becoming to walk this way of life. Some have left. I know many parents that I know, they have left. One child or more have left. But you know, they're still part of the family. God is still working with them. God is still helping them. God is still showing them. And it's our job as a family. What does families do? You're talking about God. He talks about being, going after the, the 99, going after the one and bringing that one back. And as a family, we do that. We don't let our family members, somebody's, did something even terrible, we're going to go and bring them back, incorporate them back into our family. It's the same thing we as a church family. We bring them back and we build a stronger family. Again, as I mentioned, we're going to be working together for a thousand years together. A thousand years. And for some people, it's going to be tough working with one another, but we have to, we have to work that out. You know, I think I'm going to go back to the uh, scripture that I read already in Matthew 12. You don't have to turn there. And I love this scripture because I think, you know, it, it applies so much to the Feast of Tabernacles today. When, again, we're talking about Jesus, his family was outside. Then one of them said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside speaking, seeking to speak with you. And Jesus said, this is my brother and my sister. This is my family here. Now, he wasn't forsaking his physical family, but he was saying, this is my spiritual family in front of you. And I think if Christ was here, and he is, but if he was up here speaking, he'd look out today and he said, this is my family. This is my mother, my brother, my cousin, my aunts, and my uncles. This is my family. Turn with me to Romans 8, 14, and Ryan read the scripture as well, but I, I need to read it again. Romans 8, verse 14. Romans 8, verse 14. I'm going to read this one out of the NIV. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, or almost like Daddy, Father. The spirit himself testifies itself, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in, in order that we also may share in his glory. We have an awesome future that awaits us. 
We are the family of God. We're his children. And as the scripture says, if we are children, then we are heirs with Christ if we continue to endure to the end. Do we get that? We're sitting in this room as a family, as children of God. We're co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We're part of God's family. God's family will go on into the millennium where we will be helping others become a part of that family, a family that will live for eternity.